Well, all right. Let's 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 get into the book a little bit because I think that'll just guide us. Because um, yeah. I had a great time reading this book. Um, as you know, I have a dog as well, which it's is a man, man biter. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but the book that I decided to go with. You got three books out. Obviously, the 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 SEAL Team Dog is a book more. It's a what they call in the in the literary industry. It's a YA book for yeah. young adults, right? That's what it is. But yeah, it's it's actually Navy SEAL Dogs is the young adult adaptation of Trident Canyon right, Warriors. Right. So it's the same same story. Same book. So yeah. don't buy that one if you're an adult. Don't get both of them. Yeah, don't get both of them. Yeah. But then this book, Team Dog. How to Train Your Dog the Navy SEAL Way, and what the reason? And you, as soon as I, as soon as you got here today, you're like, you know, I just got listened to the last podcast with DeSax, and there's so many parallels. You'd be surprised. And I was like, he's like, are we going to talk about that? I'm like, of course we are, because that's there's so many parallels yeah. between how you lead a dog mm-hmm. and how you lead a human. Yeah. As awful as that might sound, it's absolutely true. Oh, 100. Uh, percent One of the things you kick off here, and and I I kind of skip to the middle of the book because it's talking about selection. So I'm going to go to the book here. Selection is crucial. I can't emphasize this poison point enough. In most cases, when I've been asked to intervene in problem dog situations, what I instantly see is a mismatch, S- such as either a slightly built person or an elderly couple who have a 75-pound high-energy dog who they can't walk without being dragged along. Those people are physically incapable of exerting enough force to stop that dog from moving. A necessary first step in getting a dog to walk properly on a leash. That's just one example of how better selection could have resulted in a better relationship. And again, that's a real obvious one. That's one of the easiest ones to understand. Oh, I'm a small old woman Mm -hmm. and I can't get a hundred pound dog to drag me around. But there's a a lot of other characteristics that are way more nuanced. For instance, a dog that is super high energy and you're a working person that's busy all the time and you got to work when you're home and you're going to have that dog nipping at you all the time play with me play with me play with me play with me that's not going to be a good match mm-hmm. that's not going to be a good match at all um and and you see well you were quoting some of the quotes uh, about i mean tell me a little bit about dog ownership in America right now because i think a lot of it selection has a lot to do with where we end up with problems so there's two things, really. I mean, dog ownership as a whole is a, it's a goat rope, honestly. And, and that's where this book stems from. That's where my, my team dog online training program stems from. And frankly, the, the campaign that, that uh, I'm about to launch that, that is, in essence, the crux of the problem with, uh, with dog ownership in this country is that it's, it's mismatched, uh, poor selection, and, and most importantly, it's just uh, an inability to communicate properly with the dog. Uh, and, and, and what that stems from is very simply is that, you know, dogs' minds, um, they, if, if you think about it from, from the most basic standpoint you can, is that, you know, you, you and I, we're, we're having this conversation verbally, right? You, you dream in a language, you talk in a language, you think in a language. Uh, we communicate overwhelmingly verbally. Now, when you think about, about dogs, is that just something as simple as, as you and I meeting. Uh, if, if I come over and I shake your hand and we smile and nod, I you know, touch your shoulder, whatever, walk away, if somebody can see that from across the parking lot and know, yeah, it was a cordial, cordial greeting. You and I stand up next to each other and we're looking at each other like this and, and doing this kind of stuff and sizing each other up and turn around. Again, from across the parking lot, you know those two d- dudes are about to brawl. Now, if it's that easy for us as human beings who are overwhelmingly verbal in how we communicate to, to pick that thing up, now imagine a dog who's never thought in a language, uh, who doesn't dream in a language, doesn't communicate in a language. Now, now think about how important body language and nonverbal verbal communication skills are. It's everything to a dog. And so their, their mind uh, is an algorithm. It, it works like a calculator. It doesn't work like, like our minds. And that's, that's the biggest single crucial element where people make the mistakes is they anthropomorphize and they attach all these human associations, emotions, logic, and reasoning to a dog's brain, and it doesn't work that way. You know, the, the A plus B equals C, you know, the scientific jargon is antecedent plus behavior equals consequence. But just think of it like a calculator is that grabbing the leash plus putting it on, you know, grabbing the leash A plus putting it on B equals we go for a walk C. When A plus B is paired enough times to where dog anticipates C, that's when you have problems. How many people have you seen, you know, that have a dog that they grab the leash and he's just, you know, spinning around the moon and, and they can't even get a leash on him to take him for a walk, let alone settle down? That's why. 
is because every single time you've paired A plus B, it's equaled C, and now he's anticipating when A and he's anticipating C when A and B are present. So something as simple as breaking that context gets rid of that. You know, a lot of people, let's put a prong collar on, let's put an e-collar, let's knee him in the ribs, let's manhandle him, all these things. All you have to do is break that context, you know, and, and it's really that simple is that whether you're trying to build it or whether you're trying to break it, the process is the exact same. You're either going to make A plus B equal C enough times to where you want them to anticipate mm -hmm. it, or if C is something you don't want anticipated, you're going to make A plus B not equal it. So with the leash example, it's I go grab the leash, I click it, I wrap it around my waist, I go sit down on the couch with it. And now the dog's looking at you like his mind's blown. He's like, what the hell is going on? We're, we're supposed to be walking right now. And then I get up, I put it back, and I go sit down and go about my day. You do that enough times, and now when you grab the leash, it doesn't mean anything to him. Uh, so just as one simple example, if you think about all of these different behaviors that we as human beings inadvertently create uh, in the animal, that, that is why. It's, a, it's a, a lack of that understanding that their mind just works differently than ours. As soon as you understand that, coupled with presence, you know, I know you, you have to speak about this in, in, your, in your business leadership uh, conferences and in, in how you carry yourself, how you interact with people is huge, you know, and if it's, again, if it's that big with people, I mean, you know, you're the type of guy that, you know, you walk into a room, people are like, this dude's running, running the show, right? Um, a lot of people, you know, that we've worked with or worked for are like that, just command respect by the way they carry themselves, by the way they walk in. And if it's, again, if it's that effective just with us as human beings who aren't driven that way primarily, now imagine a dog. Like, uh, I do exercises with dogs all the times where I don't say a word to them. It'll be the first time I've ever seen a dog. I'll put a, a three-foot leash on them in a room with basically nothing in it. And this is a dog that, you know, they've had all these problems with. It's a nine-month-old, crazy high-energy dog. Um, I, I did it just the other day, actually, on the, on the trip I was on before this. This training facility was having trouble with this dog, and they wanted to go to, to using some some compulsion methods, some some prong collar and e collar stuff to, to get the dog under control. I said, let me let me mess with them for a minute. And so I I connect the leash to him. I, I walk around with him, and I just you know tugging on the leash and, and feeling him. You know, getting a feel for his personality. But you know, if you think of it like a like a bumper or a, a, a buffer, is that you're you're the buffer between that dog, his mind, and 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 the stimuli. And everything that, that goes between it, you're, you're almost the gatekeeper. Uh, and so when you, you have to get inside that dog's mind and, and be able to reach it first, you know, which, which means I have to mirror what I want out of the dog. If, if he's a spaz, I can't treat him like a spaz. I can't spaz out and yank him and yell at him and, and get all, all up in his grill about it. I need to throttle it down and, and, and be a mirror uh, or a representation, a physical representation of what I want out of him. And so it got to the point where... He, I finally got him to just relax, lay down, and I could get up and walk around the room, and he, and he wouldn't move. And he had not done that before. And it's not, it's not anything crazy magic wizard stuff. It, it, it's just it's a basic understanding of, of canine psychology, operant conditioning, uh, and the four quadrants. Uh, but, but most importantly, it's, it's that nonverbal communication aspect that, uh, that with dogs is just imperative. Um,